folks, good evening. Thanks for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Dave Rempis. I'm a saxophone player here in Chicago, uh, doing my, uh, what I believe is my sixth uh, Wednesday night stream now. Uh, they started back in the beginning of May. Uh, I've been using it as the opportunity with my record label, Aerophonic Records, to release a new digital release each week. Uh, so far we've, uh, we've done several different things. Hornithology, which was a duo record with Mars Williams. Uh, the Eagle, which was a quartet record with Michael Foster from New York, along with Jason Rebke on bass and Tyler Damon on drums, which came out about a month ago now. Uh, our third release was called Triple Double, featuring the great Jamie Branch on trumpet, alongside Ingebrigt Hokerflaten on bass and Tolif Ostvang on drums, a Norwegian rhythm section. Uh, uh, two weeks ago, we put out uh, Millenniums, which was recorded at the Chicago Jazz Festival, uh, featuring myself with Avril Ra on percussion, Jim Baker on piano, and uh, again, Ingebrigt Okaflaten on bass. And last week, we put out the record Minuscule, which was from the ongoing collaboration The Bridge, uh, which features fellow Chicagoan uh, Keith Jackson on reeds, along with some French musicians, including Christine Vodroshka on piano, Didier Lasserre on uh, drums, and Peter Orenz also on drums. So there's been a lot of different records which have uh, come out on aerophonicrecords.com. I urge you to check some of those out. Uh, we're going to be uh, releasing another one tonight in a little bit. Uh, as we were coming in there, we were listening to the, uh, the great Fred Anderson with his quartet from the 90s, uh, which included uh, Hamid Drake on drums, Harrison Bankhead on bass, and Jim Baker on piano from a record called Birdhouse that came out on Oka Disc. Uh, that was one of the first bands of Fred's that I had the opportunity to see back in the 90s uh, in Evanston, actually, at a, a restaurant called Pete Miller's, which was a steakhouse and not the uh, venue you would think that Fred Anderson would be playing at, but somehow or other they booked him there. So uh, yeah, I got to see Fred Anderson quartet along with people eating steaks and smoking cigars. Um, yeah, I'm going to uh, start tonight. Uh, I decided to do compositions all night long for once. Uh, and I'm going to play a piece called Angles of 90 Degrees that I wrote uh, about 20 years ago now for a band called Triage. Uh, yeah, this is Angles of 90 Degrees. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Thanks very much. That was Angles of 90 Degrees. Uh, that was a tune by the band Triage, uh, which was one of my early working bands. Um, started around, kind of informally, around 1997 when I met Tim Daisy, um, a drummer who I still work with today, one of my closest collaborators and, and very close friends. Uh, Tim and I met at a club called The Bop Shop in 1997 where I was bartending. And he had a night, uh, Monday night gig uh, with kind of like, a, I don't know what I would call it, hippie jam band trio with a guy playing like a turtle shell and a, a bass player and, uh, and Tim on drums. And uh, I was bartending, we met and started playing music together and uh, the rest is history. We've had uh, many, many great years together. And Triage was one of our uh, early working bands basically. Um, the title for that tune, Angles of 90 Degrees, came from uh, the second tour I ever did in Europe with the Vandermark Five. We were playing a festival in Skopje in Macedonia, and uh, the very nice young woman who was driving us around uh, that afternoon uh, was trying to describe a right angle, and she wasn't quite sure in English how to say right angle, and so she was like kind of getting at it, and finally she said, you know, an angle of 90 degrees. So that became a, a, a track a title for, uh, for this band. Um, this came out, I believe, on the 2003 release uh, uh, 20 Minute Cliff, which was on Oka Disc. Um, and the other claim to fame for that tune is that the band actually played that uh, opening up for Buckethead at the Double Door here in Chicago, a famous rock club that just closed a few years ago. Um, the one time I played the Double Door was uh, opening up for Buckethead, probably around 2004, I want to say, and uh, we opened the set with that tune uh, to a crowd of about 500 people on a very sweaty uh, uh, summer evening when uh, it was just unbelievably hot in the room. I just remember dripping sweat. Um, and uh, the Buckethead crowd liked it, um, but we never did manage to figure out who Buckethead actually is. I don't know if you know him, but he wears a, K a KFC bucket on his head while he plays shredding guitar. Uh, certainly worth checking out. Uh, I'm going to continue with another piece now. Uh, this is <clears throat> also by the band Triage. Uh, this is called uh, Rotor. And I do want to mention, uh, if you're interested in uh, supporting my record label, and, uh, and or me, <laughs> you can go to aerophonicrecords.com where uh, tonight's digital release is available, uh, all the other digital releases that have come out are available, and pretty much everything that I've put out is all available there in the last uh, seven years. Uh, this month is actually our seven year anniversary with the label, uh, uh, which happened last uh, Thursday, June 11th, was uh, uh, the seventh anniversary of putting out our first two records. Uh, so yeah, please check out the record label and uh, here's another piece for you. This one is called Rotor. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
That was called Rotor. Uh, that one came out on another record by Triage, uh, a very limited edition release of 100 copies called Stagger that came out in 2005 on the uh, Utech Records label. Um, I don't think I even have a copy of that one, unfortunately. It's, uh, it's lost in time. So uh, the release for this week, as some of you may have guessed already, is, uh, is by the band Triage, and it's uh, called Live at the Velvet, Lou <laughs> Live at the Velvet Lounge uh, 2005. Um, as I mentioned, Triage was a working band of mine with Tim Daisy. Uh, we started working together in the late 90s, and the, uh, the formation of this specific trio was a little bit squishy. It was sort of a quartet for a while. Uh, I don't know exactly when we started kind of doing material or when we named the band Triage, but I think it was around 1999 or 2000. And the original bla uh, bass player was a guy named Gordon Lewis, who uh, eventually moved away from Chicago with his wife. Uh, they're both academics and uh, found teaching jobs elsewhere. And uh, Jason Najemian, who's a fantastic bass player uh, who now lives in Alaska, actually, uh, had moved to Chicago in 2001 from Virginia. So we asked him to join the band. And at that point, we really became a working group uh, doing several tours in the States and in Europe. We released, f uh, yeah, four records between 2001 and 2005 and really used the band as an opportunity to workshop ideas and compositions uh, as young musicians. We were all in our early mid-twenties at that point um, and really trying to learn a lot about what we're doing and how the scene works and how you book a tour and how you make a record and all that kind of thing. So uh, it was really a formative uh, group for all, all three of us, I would say. Um, this record was recorded in January of 2005 at the Velvet Lounge here in Chicago. Uh, for those of you who don't know the Velvet Lounge, it was Fred Anderson's club for many, many years. Uh, this was the original Velvet Lounge that uh, really had a feeling and personality that it would kind of be impossible to, uh, to describe or duplicate. But uh, it was really a kind of classic Southside Chicago tavern. Uh, the wallpaper is quite famous. Um, you'd have to look it up online, which you can do. There's a great duo record with Fred Anderson on tenor saxophone and Robert Berry on drums uh, that has a picture of them sitting in the bar with the wallpaper behind them. And even just that kind of gives you a good feel for what this place was like. Uh, the warmth of it um, made for an incredibly special playing environment and, and an amazing place to check out music. Um, <clears throat> triage at that time was working quite a lot. Uh, uh, Tim Daisy was booking a uh, Thursday night series at a place called the uh, uh, the Nervous Center up in Lincoln Square, right next door to the Davis Theater. So uh, we had a gig down in the basement there pretty regularly. We were doing Tuesday nights at the Rock Club, The Empty Bottle. Um, I was in the Vandermark Five at that time, and uh, that band had a standing Tuesday night engagement at The Empty Bottle. But whenever Ken or other members of the band were touring, and it wasn't possible to, for Vandermark Five to play, uh, Triage would often be the substitute. So we also had a very regular platform there at The Empty Bottle. Uh, we played at uh, the second home of what is now Elastic Arts, which was then called 3030. Uh, we used to work there quite a lot. So there were a lot of spots all around Chicago where we were really able to play, but um, the Velvet, I think, for for anybody who played there at that time was really one of the, the very special ones. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but um, as I mentioned, this recording came uh, was done in January of 2005. Um, and uh, this was kind of towards the end of the band's working tenure. Uh, Jason Ajemian uh, moved away to New York not long afterwards and um, went on to work with a lot of folks in New York, um, Mark Rebo and Jamie Branch and, and all sorts of wonderful people, and is still working as a musician, although he's now moved to Alaska where he's flying airplanes and teaching other people to fly, which uh, to those of us who have driven in an automobile with Jason, uh, find that quite remarkable. So, uh, but he's up there uh, still playing music, enjoying his time flying airplanes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm gonna continue with another piece by that band that, uh, that was written around this time. Uh, this one is called Think Yellow, and the title came from a, a tour we did, I believe it was in 2003, when we were crossing the border into Canada and we, when we got up to the little booth, uh, the little cop in the little booth said, 
you know, who are you? What are you doing? And we said, well, we're a band. And, you know, and he started asking questions like, do you have any merchandise? And, you know, uh, essentially treating us the way most musicians get treated at international borders, which, which is like criminals. So, uh, you know, after talking to us for a little while, he, uh, he pointed uh, kind of straight ahead of us over to the right. And there was a flashing yellow light that he turned on and he said, pull over over there. And he handed us back the, uh, the little customs form that we'd filled out. And at the top of it, he wrote, think yellow. And so we had to give that to the uh, two cops over there who were going to search the van. And uh, so the title of this track comes from, uh, from that experience. So it's called Think Yellow. Thank <laughs> you. 
Stagger, which came out on New Tech Records in 2005. Uh, I'm going to continue with some more compositions uh, that we played with the band Triage. Uh, I do want to mention earlier I was playing uh, Fred Anderson uh, as we were opening, and that was his quartet with Jim Baker on piano, Harrison Bankhead, and Hamid Drake on drums. Uh, the recording that just came out on Aerophonic Records, which is my record label, right here. Uh, please go check it out. Uh, the recording that came out today is Triage live at the Velvet Lounge in 2005. Uh, it's under the digital releases section of the Aerophonic Records website. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, the Velvet was a place we had the chance to play quite a lot. And uh, it was a very important venue for everybody in Chicago. I can say for myself in particular, um, I had the chance to see a lot of musicians there for the first time, ranging from Fred Anderson himself. Uh, I believe I saw Hamid Drake there for the first time. Uh, Malachi Favors, Fred Hopkins, Ari Brown, Avriel Ra, Harrison Bankhead, Nicole Mitchell, David Boykin, uh, just too many people to mention who are really, really important parts of the uh, Chicago and, and worldwide improvised music scene. Um, this was really the place that was a home for the very well-known AACM, which uh, Fred Anderson was a founding member of back in the 60s. Uh, Fred went on to run a number of different clubs in, uh, in the Chicago area, both on the north and south side. Uh, the Birdhouse was one of them, which that quartet record I was playing earlier was named after. Um, uh, and of course the Velvet Lounge where this was recorded, which uh, I think Fred started his relationship with the Velvet in the late 80s or early 90s, and he wasn't the owner of it at the time, but I think he was working there. Um, he eventually took over ownership of it and started doing a jam session there in the early 90s, and then started putting on concerts there. Um, it, it was just such a special place. Um, it was incredibly gracious of Fred as really one of the best known and most influential and most important artists to come out of the, you know, black community on the south side of Chicago um, uh, in the second half of the 20th century to open his space up and create a platform for so many different artists and particularly younger artists. To come and work on their music um, was a very important opportunity for all of us and it, it uh, it made it feel important and weighty and heavy to play a lounge, uh, to play a gig at the Velvet Lounge. Not only because the feeling there was so warm, but because you knew the artists who had played on that stage, including Fred himself, were very, very serious people who had done amazing things in the music. And so uh, for us as young musicians to have the opportunity there to play there was a very, very special thing. Um, I just want to share a couple stories about Fred while we're uh, 
hanging out here. Um, one of my favorite nights <laughs> was sitting with Ken Vandermark after a Vandermark 5 gig, and this was at the old Velvet Lounge before it moved in 2006 and reopened. Um, and uh, we're sitting at the end of the bar after a gig one night, and uh, Fred was playing Charlie Parker, uh, this record called Live, or the Washington Concerts is the name of the record. And uh, this one track came on, it's, it's a live record from, uh, uh, you know, a big band with Charlie Parker's quartet also playing with the big band. And uh, I think the piece we were listening to was a medley called Out of Nowhere, and Charlie Parker's playing on it is just... Like, on another level, even for Charlie Parker, it's totally unbelievable. And uh, uh, Ken and I were sitting at the end of the bar talking, and we had both just stopped because what we were hearing come out of the stereo was, was so overwhelming. And Fred was cleaning up the bar and kind of walking down towards us. And as he, as he came around the corner of the bar, he sort of said half to himself and half to us, I wish I'd never touched a saxophone. <laughs> which I thought was an, <laughs> an amazing thing that we could all bond over this experience of listening to Charlie Parker and being completely blown away by it. Um, another night with Fred at the Velvet that really uh, had a big impact on me was a night when uh, we were playing there. It was at the new Velvet Lounge, and this was probably around, uh, probably around 20, 2009, maybe early 2010, uh, not long before Fred passed away. And uh, it was a quiet Tuesday night, like in February or something like that. And it was very cold. It was wintertime. And, uh, you know, there were probably eight people who came out for the gig. And at the end of the night, Fred came to pay me. And, and I felt bad that, you know, nobody had turned up. I mean, he's there working, running the bar, um, giving us this opportunity, probably hoping to make a little bit of money that night. And, uh, you know, the bar was empty as often it was because it was a jazz club presenting experimental music, basically. And uh, as Fred, you know, reached to hand me some money, I said thanks. And, and I said, you know, I'm sorry there's there weren't more people here tonight, Fred. And uh, and he just kind of shrugged it off and he, and he said, the music was really good tonight as if just starting a whole nother thread of conversation. And, you know, it was just so powerful to me to see somebody who could have, uh, who could have been doing a lot of things with his time at that moment. And instead he was very graciously running this, this beautiful bar, again, giving us all the opportunity to work uh, on our music there. So uh, yeah, big thanks to Fred. The last Fred story I want to share was <laughs> also at the new Velvet Lounge. Uh, Fred always had a, a a black velvet painting up at the back of the bar and it was of a, a, a naked black woman uh, sitting kind of like for a portrait uh, kind of sitting at a 45 degree angle to the, to the um, painter basically and uh, it was this you know probably three foot by two foot painting that hung at the back of the bar for many 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 years at both the old velvet lounge and the new velvet lounge and uh, again, sometime not long before Fred passed away, I, I was playing a gig there, and it was the end of the night. I think uh, I think it might have just been me and Fred hanging out at that point. And uh, and Fred said, "Man, I got to show you this." And he had this smile on his face that was very Fred Anderson. Like if you knew Fred, he was somebody who who when he was pleased, like his smile could just like uh, melt the entire room. Like he he transmitted this like beautiful peaceful energy through his smile. And uh, <laughs> he had that smile on his face, and <laughs> and it was like like a you know almost like a schoolboy kind of thing. He was so excited, and he pulled out this letter that somebody had sent him, and it was a picture of this same woman from this painting that had been hanging on the wall for so many years, and uh, and it turned out that she was actually the first black woman featured in Playboy magazine, and so she had you know a. a <laughs> interesting role, I guess, in the progression of the civil rights movement in, in the United States in a way. And Fred was just kind of so like tickled to find out who this person was because she'd been this anonymous woman who was almost the mascot of the Velvet Lounge for so many years. And to kind of put a face with a name and a significant piece of history, I think was really, really exciting for him. So just a few little Fred stories to share. Um, yeah. Once again, the, the record is called Live at the Velvage Lounge 2005. It's with the band Triage. It's available at aerophonicrecords.com. Uh, I'm going to play another piece now. Uh, this one was another one that we used to do with Triage. This is a ballad that, uh, that I wrote called Cape Coast.
Cape Coast. Uh, that tune is actually on the brand new record, along with one that I played earlier, uh, Rotor. Uh, yeah, those are both on the record that came out today, 
Live at the Village Lounge, uh, available at aerophonicrecords.com. Uh, uh, several people have emailed me today actually asking about some of the other triage records that came out. Uh, the last one where some of this material is on uh, was a limited edition of only 100 copies that came out in 2005. So um, I have no idea where to find that. I don't think it's available. But there are actually several triage titles available on Okadisc. Uh, Okadisc was a Chicago-based label for many years and uh, for some reason or other was gracious enough to put out the first few records by this band. Um, why, I don't know. At the time they were putting out stuff by people like Fred Anderson and Peter Brotzman and Joe McPhee and Ken Vandermark and all these, you know, very heavyweight people. But uh, Bruno Johnson, the owner of Okadisc, was a uh, incredibly kind to support this band as a bunch of dumbass kids and put our first few records out, uh, which I still to this day can't thank him enough for that. Um, those are still available through the OkaDisc website, okkadisc.com. Uh, check them out. I know a few people actually ordered some records from him today because I heard about it from him. So uh, yeah, uh, go check those out. American Mythology, which came out in 2004, is available there. And 20 Minute Cliff, which I believe came out in 2003, is also available there. So uh, yeah, check those out. I'm going to uh, play one more piece for you tonight. This is called 2187, uh, also from that same time period. Uh, big thanks to everybody for tuning in. I just want to check in on the chats here while we're here. Hey guys, Kip and Brian and uh, Paul and uh, yeah and Adam. Uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, as always, I really really appreciate it and glad to have some folks here for these. Uh, I do plan to hopefully continue these. Um, I may go from a weekly schedule to a bi-weekly schedule at some point in July, um, but we'll see how that shakes out. Uh, yeah, uh, this last one is called Twenty One Eighty Seven, and thank you all for tuning in tonight.
thank you very much. Once again, that was 2187. Thank you all for tuning in tonight. I will be back uh, next week with another brand new release. Uh, same location, same time, 8 p.m. Uh, Central Standard Time. I uh, really appreciate all of you tuning in. I'm going to uh, send us out with another uh, uh, recording by Fred Anderson. This is a duo that he and Hamid Drake put out, and this is a piece of his called uh, Black Woman. Thank you so much for tuning in.